morning. It's so good to be here with you all today. And I'm just going to put it out front that they did not force me to do any, you know, torturous detox thing in order to go along with this sermon series, thankfully. I mean, unless if you guys start moving toward me with weird juice, like I'm running away, right? I'm, I'm watching you. I'm watching you. Uh, so Pastor Chris has been in a, like a weird sensory deprivation chamber. He was floating around in there a couple weeks ago, and then he had to do a couple shots of wheatgrass. And so, yeah, I think I'm getting spared from all of that, right? Right? I know, right? Yeah, yeah, because my, my level of detox would probably be like moving into the woods, but the problem with that is that I don't have any of the gear, as probably Mr. Bainey knows, when Zachary was in scouts with this troop. Uh, boy, we went to REI and bought all kinds of new stuff because we have never been a camping family. Um, but we learned a lot, and it was wonderful. It was an amazing experience for him, and we um, absolutely credit so much of his current success to what he learned in scouting. So we're so excited to be partnering with you all. Um, today, we are going to look at the idea of rest, and our, our uh, text, of course, is still Isaiah 30, verse 15, which I think you've seen here. It says, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and in rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength, but you were unwilling. Uh, those four words that we are kind of looking at over these next weeks, returning, rest, quietness, trust, all of those concepts work together. We sh hope, I hope that we can not think of them as four things that we need to do, but four things that are part of experiencing God fully and in the rich and abundant life that he has for each one of us, that we would experience returning, as Pastor Chris preached a few weeks ago, about repentance. That's about turning away from sin, turning away from living independently from God and embracing a life of dependence upon him. And today we're going to talk about rest in a little bit, but in this passage that Isaiah has, has given to us, to be saved, of course, means everything that you think that it means in that it is to be delivered from sin, it is to be transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of the love of God, and, uh, but also it offers a life lived in a broad and spacious place. One of the uh, commentators I read said that it's opulent. It's a life of, of beauty and fullness and richness. And I was just thinking about that. What would that be like to live in a broad place where you can breathe freely, where we can just sort of inhale and exhale and be at peace in the midst of the chaos of the world that we are surely all still still kind of dealing with. And so I hope today that we can look at what the word says about that type of life, to be grounded in our hearts in peace. In the New Testament language, to be saved, of course, is to be in Christ. The Apostle Paul loved that phrase, in Christ. If you are in Christ, you have received him as your savior. You have allowed the blood of his cross to be applied to your life, that there is redemption for us through the cross of Christ. Certainly, that's what that means. But as we think about rest, how should we understand this in the light of being in Christ? So if you would like to, if you want to use your electronic device or your hard copy Bible, whatever you've got, your, your scroll, whatever you brought today, uh, turn to Matthew 11. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 11 today, if you would like to. Um, and I'm, we're going to uh, launch from verse 28, but I just wanted to set this up in the context a little bit. This is an interesting moment, and I've always really loved that this first part of chapter 11 in Matthew is, is here because it's, just, it's an interesting moment to me where John the Baptist is in prison. And of course, we know that he was the forerunner of Christ, and he was the one that had the amazing responsibility to proclaim that the Lamb had come, the Messiah is here, it's him. And then John goes to prison, and things don't really pan out the way that he thought they were going to. Expectations were probably not being met, particularly at that moment. And so he sends some of his disciples to Jesus, and they're supposed to ask Jesus, you know, are you the one, or is there somebody else? You know, are we waiting for someone else, or is it you? And Jesus reminds him, and I think this is so salient to our point today, Jesus reminds him, to go back and tell John what you have seen and heard. 
Tell John what I say and what I do. And that should be the indicator to him of who he is because Jesus is absolutely about claiming messiahship in this, in this case. He's underscoring in this passage the need for humility and the fact that when things are revealed to us, it's because we're coming to it with a humble heart, with an open heart to him. And that if I'm gonna be self-reliant and think that I've got all the answers, I'm just not gonna see and know the things that I need to see and know in order to navigate this life. And Jesus too speaks about the response, the relationship rather that he has with the Father. And in this passage that we're gonna look at, he's gonna offer himself as the source of rest. So if you care to stand or are able to stand, feel welcome to, and we'll read the word together this morning. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, that's kind of all the, a lot of the things that have been going on before Jesus gives this beautiful uh, message to the disciples. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. And he said to them, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is the Lord of the Sabbath. Let's pray. Lord, we love you today. God, we give you all the glory and the praise, Father, and I pray you'd help us to focus our hearts and our minds upon you, Lord, because you are the only one worthy you are the only one, Father, who should capture our attention. And so, Father, help us today to focus in on your word and to hear your spirit speak in our hearts. I thank you for the rest that you offer us in your presence today. Thank you for the rest that you offer us in your presence today. In the wonderful name of Jesus, amen. Amen, thank you. Please feel welcome to be seated. So. Usually, you know how it goes. I get up here and I, I overshare too much about myself. So today's no different. So I'm gonna tell you, something you might not know about me is that I really enjoy sleeping a lot. Like I am a sleep enthusiast. Like Pastor Christine, I think, might be possibly of a similar mindset with me. And in fact, she gave me something a couple, oh, when was it? A little while ago, a couple, maybe a couple years ago? Uh, and I don't know that I have ever felt more seen and understood than when I got this gift from Pastor Christine, Pastor Christine and it says, I was born to be wild, but only until 9 p.m. or so. And that, this is like the ABCs of me right here. This is it, this is it. If you wanted to know, here I am. Born to be wild, but only till nine because I need to sleep, so. <laughs> Sleep is important, and Chris and I have uh, watches, of course, that can track your sleep. You can have the app that will tell you exactly how many hours of deep sleep you got, you know, what your heart rate was, how things were going. Uh, so we wake up in the morning and we compare notes to see how did the sleep go. And I will tell you, generally, I win. I, I, am, I am that good. I sleep well. And honestly, though, I do tell you, I'm grateful. I'm grateful. I shouldn't be arrogant about it. I'm really, really thankful. But the sleep app will tell you kind of you know, where you are and there are times, I'm not sure, oh yeah, there it is. So sometimes I've noticed that I'm in bed quite a while, I mean that's almost seven hours, right? But look at the deep sleep, which is the, the far circle to the right over there. Almost like zero deep sleep, right? My heart rate was eh, not that good. Quality of sleep was not that great either. So just because I'm resting or prone doesn't mean that I'm actually resting in any kind of deep sense. And sometimes I've noticed that the app will send me what I call the death emoji. Yeah, there it is. I get that. And it's on my like daily readiness. So I mean, that can't end well, right? I'm just saying. If that's what you're seeing first thing in the morning, just stay in bed, don't get up, just stay there, seriously. I'm pretty sure that's what that means, right? Yeah, so. 
So resting is important, and in the passage that we just read, Jesus absolutely connects rest to our relationship with him in a spiritual sense. There is no rest apart from him, and we can probably just look sort of around in the world or right out our front door and realize that this is not a restful place in general. Our culture is not at rest. So many times our own internal landscape is not at rest, and Jesus knows because he created us that we must rest in a physical sense, in a spiritual sense, an emotional sense, mentally, we need it. And so he's not gonna leave us in the dark of what that is meant to be. Certainly through salvation, belief in Christ, we will have everlasting rest with him, peace with God that he has gained for us, Paul wrote. But he's also referring, I really believe, to a rest through doing life with him. And I think we can see that in, in those first verses that we will come to him. Everyone, who, everyone who, is, who is laboring, everyone who is heavy laden, and he says, and I will give you, I will give you rest. Because I think rest is about living eternally, but it's also about flourishing right now in this moment. And he's inviting his hearers and by extension us to trust him not just follow the rules or know a lot of good facts about him, but actually to know him. And he's offering himself as entirely sufficient for us. And I love the song that you guys sang this morning, I'm not enough unless you come, because I think that we know that. Deep down somewhere we know that we're, we're just not gonna, we're not enough. We're not enough for what is demanded of us to live this life. So we must have the Lord. We must have him, right? We're not enough unless you come, and gratefully he has agreed to come again and again and again, and my failure of the moment is not enough to keep him away. And I'm so grateful for that because I could never earn his good favor. He offers himself as entirely sufficient for each one of us, and the atmosphere of a rested heart is dependent and trustful and awake to life. I'm gonna say that one more time. The atmosphere of a rested heart is dependent on God. It's trustful, believing that he has my good at heart, and it's awake to life. Because to rest in Christ is to flourish. It's to have the abundant life that Jesus talked about in John 10.10. 10. And it's hard for us because many of us have learned through difficult experience that relying on other human beings is generally not a great idea. And we can to some degree, certainly, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for you all. And I, I was thinking in the prayer room this morning and all of you here and everybody online, what an amazing family that this is and how you take care of each other so well and the unity that God, God alone has brought in this place and in our hearts is miraculous and it's beautiful. But ultimately, people cannot be our answer, right? And the Lord, I think, set it up that way because he wants us to live in complete dependence upon him. He wants to be the one on whom we cast our hope. And so wisdom tells us that there is no human being that can care for us like Jesus can. There is none that can fill our hearts. And so we have the choice of either coming to him as he has called us to do, or we can be left on our own to sort of strive to have our needs met. And I don't know if you've tried that much. I sure have, and it's not great. It doesn't end well, it's like the death emoji, <laughs> right? So Jesus is gonna use the story here that we have just read to remind his hearers of what Sabbath rest is really about. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. In the passage that we read into in Mark 12, sorry, Mark, Matthew 12, Jesus is telling the story, reminding the hearers and the, the Pharisees who were all bent out of shape because the disciples were grabbing grain as they're wandering through the fields and they probably were hungry. And they were accusing Jesus essentially because he was the teacher, he was responsible for all the behavior of the disciples. And they said, you know, look at what they're doing. They're breaking the Sabbath law and that's a problem 
And Jesus says, but do you remember, did you read what David did when he was hungry and when he went into the house of God and ate the bread of the presence? So this bread was 12 loaves that would sit in the presence of God in the holy place and every Sabbath, the priests would eat the bread that had, had been there for the week. Apparently it lasted and it was all right. So they would eat that and then they would replace it with hot bread every Sabbath. Like how great is that, right? If, if I had thought quickly enough, I would have had like a bread maker. Remember when you did that and like the whole sanctuary was filled with hot bread? But that's just, the smell of that is like, yes. So the Lord had, by his divine decision, to have bread sitting in his presence, 12 loaves to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the law said that the priests were the only ones who were allowed to eat this bread. That was was not lawful for anyone else to do. But part of their priestly duties was to eat it in the holy place uh, after, after they were replacing it with, with the new bread. And the, uh, the sense, of course, was that the priests were the representative of the people before God. And this seems to me just a natural foreshadowing of the Eucharist, the idea that we would partake of bread to remember what Christ had done. God was already getting that symbolism out there so that when it happened that we would be able to see it and understand it by the, the gift of his spirit. But for the people of Israel, bread demonstrates that God is the source of their life and their nourishment. Of course, you remember manna in the wilderness, and they weren't too excited about that either at times where God would send the manna every day and they would go out and gather it and make a little cake out of it. And they got pretty bored with that. But bread is what sustained them in that 40 years. Wandering through that great and terrible desert, God gave them food, God gave them water, everything that they needed for them to live and to flourish. But bread is a profound symbol of the Christ, of the Messiah in the Old Testament as well. Uh, Those two things would have been linked together in the Jewish mindset, and in fact, they were expecting the Messiah to produce bread. So after Jesus fed the 5,000, if you remember the story, with the five loaves and the two fish in John 6, the people were about to take him by force and make him king because it has to be him. He made bread. Jesus would use that symbol and as a uh, self-denominating, he would call himself the bread of life in John's gospel and he offered himself as the bread and the wine at the last supper. This is my body, this is my blood, he told the disciples in the um, inauguration of the new covenant. Uh, Frederick Buechner wrote this about the bread and the wine. It's a foreshadowing of great hope and the bringing forth of a deep mystery Frail as Jesus knows the disciples to be, yet he feeds them with himself. The bread is his flesh and the wine is his blood and they are all of them, including Judas, to eat it and to drink him down. And I love this line, they are to take his life into themselves and to come alive with it. The sense that Christ is the source of our nourishment and we are reminded of that every single time that we partake of communion together not to go back in our minds to some dim past, but to allow the act of recalling Christ to be in this immediate present, to remember that he is here with us as surely as when he walked the earth. And if we're in Christ, we have the Holy Spirit within us, and he is with us to remind us of the words of Christ. John 6, 35, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. And later in that chapter, at verse 57, he says, as the living Father sent me, I live because because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. The Pharisees had gotten things a bit backwards in this case, and the Sabbath for them had become about rule-following and and doing what was prescribed and religious ritual um, instead of being about God and people, enjoying fellowship together. And I have loved some of the things that we've been learning and doing um, in spiritual formation here at, at our church and learning about the disciplines, centering prayer and certainly fasting and things that, that we have done before Um, breath prayer and uh, certainly the Eucharist and the things that we do to remind us of who Jesus is to us. 
And there's so much beauty in so much of the ritual and the things that we can enjoy in the church, but it must always lead to Christ. And when Jesus uses the word, something greater than the temple is here, he's talking about himself. That everything to do with temple worship pointed to him. That the redemption through his blood, all the symbolism and the beautiful things that we read in the the Exodus and Leviticus passages of what the wilderness tabernacle was like and, and Solomon's temple, all of that was to point to Jesus. Restored abundant life in relationship with God. And ultimately, Sabbath was intended to offer restful celebration to the people of God. Restful celebration. I think that's a wonderful phrase. It's a foretaste of paradise, writes Susanna Heschel. Sabbath is a metaphor for paradise and a testimony to God's presence and all the goodness that is coming. We can have those moments where we enjoy the Sabbath right now, and God certainly set that up when we look at the pattern of creation where for six days he labored and created this beautiful world that we have. And on the seventh day, he rested. And that can be the pattern for us as well. And if it's not on Sunday or Saturday, it's great to find a day where we can rest because I know many people work on Saturdays and Sundays. But it's more about finding that place in our lives for quiet, for communion with him, to be in his presence just to let him love us, to experience all that's coming right now when heaven and earth become one, when we commune with our Savior. So how do we experience true rest? And I think one of the things that really uh, got my attention this time when I was studying this, this passage again in the sense of the, the Isaiah 30, was that to some degree we have the ability to choose it or not. As Isaiah wrote the words that we started out with, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and in rest you shall be saved, and in quietness and trust shall be your strength. And then there's this terrible phrase, but you were unwilling And I know our our pastor gave us the context of that a couple weeks ago, that Isaiah was speaking to the the people because they were ready and willing and were already kind of moving in that direction to have uh, an alliance with Egypt to save themselves from the Assyrians, which, I mean, that could blow your mind because didn't the Lord do all that work to get them out of Egypt, sent the plagues, You know, the miraculous thing in the middle of the night where Pharaoh's like, get out, I want you out of my country. And they leave. And then God takes them to the Red Sea. And they're all, they're boxed in, essentially. Egyptians behind them, Red Sea ahead of them. And God parts the waters and they go through and they're saved. And so now, all these years later, they've decided that Egypt sounds like a great ally. Let's let's join up with them in order to save themselves from the Assyrians. And this is such a, such a, boy, we do this. They're doing it on the macro level. We do it on the micro level, right? Where we're just, I'm just not sure, God, that you're gonna work this out for me the way that I want you to or the way that's gonna you know, protect me. So I think I'm going to make my own alliances. And I'm speaking to myself. Believe me, I have done this so many times where I have tried to find sources of trust in other places besides the Lord. And I've noticed this about myself, that I often want certainty, and I want control, and especially when things get difficult. I want to know, and I want to control it. And so often, and I was thinking about this, when I find my mind racing with these obsessive thinking patterns, I don't, I'm sure I'm not alone, please, don't let me be alone. (laughs) Right? Thank you. I realized at one point, all of a sudden, that it's, it's my trust issue, that I am gonna think this out 50,000 times because I'm just not sure that God's seen all the angles and that maybe, maybe I'll see something and under, you know, this is ridiculous, right? I mean, I would never say this out loud, except here in public in front of all of you, <laughs> that because I don't trust him, because I don't trust him, I'm gonna try to work it out on my own and I'm gonna allow all these thoughts, like gerbil mind, Monkey mind, I think it's called sometimes, either one, it works. Where it's just chaotic in there. 
And learning how, and I really believe that learning how to step into the flow of those thoughts and all the stories that I attach to those thoughts that make it harder and harder to, to pull it back, that that is what the Lord was talking about through the Apostle Paul when he said that we take every thought captive. We step into the flow and we say, no, no, I am not gonna continue with that mode of thinking. I'm gonna remember that God is good and that God has told me that he is the source of my hope and my trust and that I can rely on him for life, for abundance, for all the goodness that he has for me. And are things hard now? Yes. Do I not see a way out? Right, I don't. But I'm gonna trust that God is good. I trust that God is good, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. You are good, Lord. He's working on our behalf. So how do we demonstrate the willingness to embrace rest? And I think Jesus laid it out for us very directly. He says, come to me, come to me. And he has certainly pursued every single one of us, but he's not gonna force us to interact with him. He draws us kindly and he desires for us to come. So we acknowledge that God will provide for us without our striving. And we've talked about how this rest will save us, that we have repented, we've returned away from sin. And in rest, we're choosing to trust Christ for salvation and for a life of flourishing right now. Matthew 12, seven and eight, and Jesus speaking to the Pharisees, he says, had you known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus is referring to uh, the words of Hosea there, Hosea 6.6, 6, where the Lord is saying, I want steadfast love more than I want you to, to haul the oxen into my temple. I'm much more concerned about your hearts and our relationship together more than the things that you're doing The Sabbath points to Christ. If he is the Lord of the Sabbath, he desires to fellowship with us in the Sabbath. We can be with him. Silent prayer, coming and just letting him him love us, allowing him to speak to us through his word, through the Holy Spirit, turning our attention to the beautiful world that we have, allowing him to show himself who he is through the beauty of nature. Every morning, just waking up, just saying, Lord, I'm just gonna give you my simple loving attention today. I just wanna turn my eyes to you. And all the times when I get distracted and, and look away, Lord, just draw my heart back. Help me to continue to refocus and refocus. And I used to feel so guilty about that, that I would start the day with, Lord, okay, I wanna give you my full attention. And then life would happen and I would get scattered and I would feel so badly coming, oh, Lord, I'm sorry, I turned my heart away. But what I really believe is that those times, every time that I come back again and again and again, it's the opportunity to receive the welcome of God again and again and again. And that he is never frustrated with me for losing, in, losing focus or being distracted. He knows what it's like to be us. He knows what it's like to be us. And he understands what it feels like to trust him. But he asks for it anyway, because he knows that he is ultimately and completely and eternally forever trustworthy. He is looking back at us with love. I just wanna read this one other closing thought by Jim Gordon today. A life of faith isn't a life immune to the hard knocks of life. We all bear the consequences of our humanity. We experience suffering and illness in ourselves and in those we love. And there are bereavements and losses and we have times of mental ill health or difficult work or family circumstances, all these things we know. In the midst of all of life's realities, the Lord offers us himself. 
when Sabbath moments of the soul, those brief glimpses that we have of unexpected wonder, unlooked for surprise, the times when we're ambushed by beauty, the words of Jesus, consider the lilies, look at the birds. We can learn to look for joy as we seek his face, as we pay attention to what's going on around Christ, as we hold life carefully as the precious gift that it is, and we can learn to notice when God is nudging us awake to blessing, to his presence right here with us in this moment. As we go out these doors, he is with us. That is where we find rest. That is where we find peace is in the presence of God and we never have to leave it. We never have to be without it. And every time we wander or feel distracted or feel chaotic or s fragmented in our hearts, he's welcoming us back and he's smiling, drawing us to his presence. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Jesus, one of the amazing prophecies about you is that you were the Prince of Peace. And I need it. I need peace, Lord. I think probably I'm not alone here today that we all need it. And Lord, I think one of the ways that we experience your peace, Lord, is by letting you reign. The fact that you are the Prince of Peace means that you are the reigning one of peace. And so, Lord, as I allow my heart more and more and more to be surrendered to your Lordship, that I will experience more of your peace. As I allow myself to trust in you, as I allow myself, Lord, to be more and more dependent upon you and on your word and on your spirit, Lord, that you would fill my heart with your peace, because everywhere you reign, Lord, there is peace. So reign in me, reign in us, Lord. I just thank you for my brothers and sisters today. And I'm so grateful to be in this moment with them. And just pray, God, that everything that you know that is going on in every heart and every life here, all the thoughts that are going through all the minds here, Lord, that your peace would reign. We would breathe your presence in, Lord. Deep breath. You are sufficient. You are everything that we need. Thank you, Jesus. We uh, just stand if you're physically able and yeah. mm. it still always comes back to Jesus. It's always Jesus. This is the posture of the church of the living God in 2021, as much as it has for the past 2000 years, still Jesus is at the center of everything that we would do and experience. It's all about him. And so some might say, well, it's like a pat answer to just say, you just need Jesus. Well, guess what? You just need Jesus, yeah, amen? Jennifer, thank you. Beautiful word, beautiful word. Yeah, beautiful. And I was, I was just looking, were you, it is your bedtime. No, it says 9, 9 p.m. or 9 a.m. All right. That is good. May we be encouraged today. And again, uh, please, folks, let's, let's, let's step in deeper, deeper. I like that, uh, I like the little, the little icon there. It's deep rest, right? Deep sleep. So, Jesus, that's the space, right? And uh, may we all have that. Encourage each other in that journey in Christ. Let me bless you. Available to you in the name of, oh, look at there. There's no more death emoji. I got that one just for you. 
Folks, uh, those of you that are guests today, we, we do. Jennifer and I would love to, to greet you at the door, and others uh, want to take a moment just to enjoy some fellowship together. We bless you guys. We thank you for worshiping with you online, in person, anticipating what God's doing. If you haven't registered your kids for day camp or put the word out, that is just going gangbusters, so it's coming up middle of June. But together, Pastor Jennifer and I would like to bless you. Would you receive from the Lord? We bless you in the reality of who Jesus is. We bless you with the strength and the joy that comes from him and him alone. I bless you, we bless you in the perfect rest who is Jesus, the Lord of the Sabbath. To him be all the glory and honor in his church forever and ever and all of you shouted, Amen and amen. Come on, bless the Lord one more time. Give you thanks. We love you guys.